Gates. Well, it's good to see you here this morning, and um, uh, it's also good to see Nick here, uh, that uh, from Truth for Today. And uh, we are certainly enjoying the fact that our ministry is going worldwide on on the net. And as I say, I'm getting emails from various people all over the place. They've got good questions. They keep me on my toes, and that's good. It's always good to get good questions. As teachers, we enjoy it. And um, do we ever get stumped as teachers? Sure do. Yeah, there's times when you get stumped and you say, mm, yeah, that's a very good question. Have to research and return on that one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that happens. I mean, we don't know everything. Um, and that's part of the interesting thing about any particular study. If you say you know everything, you're in trouble. Uh, if you think about any particular topic, I don't care what it is. To say that you know that subject 100% has got to be untrue. It's got to be an untrue statement. Why? Because things feed into other things. And because you don't know all those other things, and there are connections there uh, that you may, may not even appreciate, it would be a very foolish thing to say, oh, I know everything about that. That's not going to work. So great to see you, Nick, here, and I hope you enjoy the service. And enjoy it out there in Thunderbird. <laughs> Um, well, today we're moving into this part three of a study of uh, law and grace, and already there's some things in here I want to bring to your attention, which perhaps we have glossed over, and myself included. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee that we've got this opportunity to meet together and to research and understand and apply things that are eternal, that have been written and preserved for us through Thy work in this on this planet through thy Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, um, law and grace. And you notice I didn't say law or grace. or uh, Law uh, by grace or some other combination. I took a deliberate uh, conjunction and here. Law and grace. And this will provoke things. In fact, uh, perhaps a can of worms will open up here. And the law of commandments, Paul talks about, found in these decrees, is going to turn out to be a very massive part of the study. And we have touched on it, but we haven't, we haven't really examined it carefully, carefully. And this has to do with the middle wall of partition. The very fact that Paul would talk about the middle wall of partition which goes back to Israel, is in itself an interesting thing. And when you consider that, there were laws before Moses in the book of Genesis. It really opens up an interesting idea about how God deals with man. And here I've got listed these decrees that we find in the book of Acts. The context of the decrees mentioned in Ephesians and Colossians, though, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it, that's the handwriting, out of the way, nailing it, that's the handwriting, to his cross, turns out to be a massive study and one which brings a lot of light to the whole nature of these ordinances and the commandments, this handwriting as we find written here. Uh, these passages are where you find grace and law in the same verse. That is a mention of grace and law. They, these turn out to be massive. They turn out to be very informative. And we're going to look at John soon uh, about this particular statement. But in its context, the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Um, Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And this is extremely important where the Lord says concerning the scribes and Pharisees uh, that they tithe mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So we are interested in the law and specifically the weightier matters, judgment, mercy, and faith. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Oh, both, you see. So the Lord is very interesting here in his condemnation of the 
uh, scribes and the Pharisees that they took one thing, but they forgot about the weightier matters. We're interested in the weightier matters. We are. And you must look at these. Um, and we looked at the use of the word Torah and how you find, sorry, how you find it in Genesis 26.5 because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my law. This is before Moses. Before Moses. There were commandments, statutes and laws. And you just have to face that. That pre-law, as we call it, there is law. Coming on down here, you find also the second use. One law shall be to him that is homeboard and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. One law. Interesting again. The first mention of the law was pre-Moses and was in the book of Genesis. The second use now in Exodus talks about one law for both the stranger and for the homeborn. Interesting, don't you think? That is a very fascinating point and one which we need to examine even further. If you look at this word anomos, see the alpha on the front is what we call alpha privative. That is, it negates what comes after. Alpha, nomos, simply without law, nomos law, without law. And this is often translated as transgressor. You're without law, you're a transgressor. That's not something, generally speaking, we as Christians would like to be called transgressors. Not really. We don't want to be called that. The Antichrist is going to be a massive transgress tra transgressor. Very, very important to see this. Now, a little bit later on, Paul qualifies his use of this term to, and being as lawless to gain the lawless. A very special context. There's a King James Version issue here in Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 15, 28, whereas if you look at it in modern Bibles, a very easy verse to remember because it's not there. So the whole issue of the, uh, the Bible and what Bible we should read from and what is authoritative, what is the Word of God, comes up again. We've done a whole series on the King James Bible and we like to think that we've hit the nail on the head on that. And uh, we think there's a great deception going on within the co Christian community about this. The Code of Haram Hammurabi, these laws that you find pre-law, found some of them their way into the ancient texts, scribed onto stone, used as a code of uh, law in the ancient world. Uh, this is from um, Bullinger's Appendices. Um, and Appendix 15, where he goes through the law before Sinai. Really cool, going through and showing you these various laws. And we see the laws of Hammurabi operating Genesis in the following instances. So he goes through and shows you these them there. Uh, the following is a list of 34 laws seen the force in Genesis. 34 laws actually documented. So that, that's very fascinating. That's what we did last time. So that's a quick nutshell of what we did last time. But what we're going to do today is we're going to move on a little bit further. And I want to ask further questions, um, what we need to know. What is the law? We need, I'm not going to answer these in, in, in order here, but we're going to answer these eventually, all of these questions. What is the law? What is the law's significance and domain? What are its weaknesses and strengths? Paul says to the Romans, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace not under the law but under grace what then does the law say to us in our age what does it say to us nothing well a lot of people want to say nothing i can remember one person i had in fellowship one time says ah old testament just need to throw it out it's got no, no value to us uh, what subset of the law is category categorically for us these are some questions that we need to look at very carefully. Um, uh, in my history as a person who studied the Bible, I can remember um, I used to mix it up a little bit with the mid-Acts people. That is, they believed that the church of which we are part began sometime midway through the book of Acts. And their concentration was on the gospel, the gospel. And they believed that the mystery essentially was 
the gospel as Paul preached. That's it. That's the mystery, which is categorically false. It's not correct. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what they were trained under. And they made a huge big issue about law and grace. And there is a big issue about law and grace, but that's it. It stopped there, law and grace. Now, in conjunction with the law, we're interested in what Moses says, because the law came by Moses. That's the Lord's statement. The Lord said that, not me. The law came by Moses. Okay, let's accept that to be true. And so if you look at this word, mousies, mousies, this is uh, where you'll find all the passages. Well, we're not going to go through all of them, but it's good to see that uh, there's a good sprinkling of the word Moses in the New Testament. And you do find it in some places uh, written by Paul and also after the revelation of the mystery. So we're going to look at some of these places. Now, let's go, first of all, to the book of John. Let's start our journey, right? Our journey into this whole topic, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It's, uh, I've learned already some, some amazing things. So John uh, is a tremendous epistle. Now, we've given some time to John's um, gospel. We spent a lot, about, a lot of time on the significance of John's gospel. And it's different, and it's separate, and it has some very important things to say. Uh, like, for example, in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. starts off with the statement about the Logos, that the, the Logos uh, was with God, and the, this Logos was God. That's the substance. The substance of the Word is God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. All things. All things made by by Logos. And without him was not anything made that was made. No exception. It's very emphatic, isn't it? The way it starts. The one who is Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Very distinctive beginning. And it says here, in him uh, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, if you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll find that there is also a beginning there where it talks about th this light shining out of darkness, right? There's a light that shined out of the darkness. Creative act happened in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then what you get is light coming out of that darkness, a reformation. Here you've got something very parallel. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So this John here is going to be this tremendous witness to the coming one. The same came for a witness, to be a witness of the light that all men through him might believe. So he came as a witness of the light. And what you're going to see straight off, right at the very beginning, is this fundamental truth that there's always some kind of type, some sort of picture of the truth, and then Christ becomes the reality. Right? There is light, and then there is capital light. There is some sort of picture in the, the Old Testament, and then there is the reality. Paul talks about this in Colossians a lot. And he says this, he was not that light. Oh, okay, there you go. John was not that light. He was a witness to that light. Was, was John showing light? Yes, but he himself was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true, oh, the true light. This is going to be important. These words are going to frame the whole discussion. The whole thing's been framed for us. And if you don't see the framing of this discussion, you're going to miss a tremendous amount in here. Notice, you get the discussion about the light. It's very clear. John's not that light. He bore witness 
of the light, and that light is known as true light. There's pictures, there's types, but Jesus is the antitype of that. It's the true light, you see? Very important to see this. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, I believe that's true. Every man that comes into the world gets this light. Now, every man doesn't have to say, yeah, I'm going to follow that light. I'm going to run that race and search it out. Well, some people will listen to the witness of demons that say, come over here. I've got some nice little candy for you over here. But that candy is laced with cyanide. You know what I'm saying? He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Whoa, what a sad thing, you know. It's the nature of God, that he's not going to be like some bouncer. And that's, you know, these big bouncers. I don't know if you've seen some of these, <laughs> these guys that all they do all day long is pack down the stake and <clears throat> pump the weights, and they've they got arms out like this, you know. And they, they can't even walk, you know. <laughs> And their job is often to be some kind of bouncer. And, you know, you do what they say or else. You know what I'm saying? And the arm will go up the back and it'll go with a crack. You know? And you're going you're gonna to do what that person says. God's not like that. He's not going to just get you to say, yes, God, because you're breaking my bones. No. You're going to have the choice. God's going to allow you to have that choice, which presupposes... Free will. I'm not a Calvinist, friends, if you didn't know that. No, I'm not a Calvinist. I think Calvin was deceived totally about this matter. It doesn't mean to say he's wrong in everything. That's just not the way truth is. And error. Anyway, that's another subject. You know. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another time in more detail. And it says this, uh, down here, um, uh, verse 11, He came unto his own things. He came unto his own things. And his own people. Distinction. He came unto his own things. And then it says, and his own people received him not. You see, he came. When the Lord came, he came to his own thing. There was a reason and a purpose for him coming, and he came according to prophecy, and prophecy declared the bounds of Messiah's work. And he came to his own things, not to just any old thing. He came to his own things as prescribed by prophecy. And then his own people, the nation of Israel, it says here, received him not. Yeah, that's the thing, right? This is the beginning of it. See, I believe that this book of John starts where Israel has rejected the Lord. But as many as received him to them gave he the power, the right to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, they've got to believe. That's it. You've got to believe on his name which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's the action. The action of God is that He does the saving, and it's His will. You can say, well, uh, you know, I have every right. I demand to be saved. I believed. Yeah, okay, but it's still God's choice. It's God's choice whether He saves you. And He saves you by His will. And he makes choice of you based upon your declaration of faith in him through Christ Jesus. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so notice where it says the word was made flesh. Okay, so that's where the word took on human form in some way. Now, this is what I believe it means. The Word became flesh in the womb. It became flesh in the womb. So we always think of flesh, a fully formed human being, right? But it just says flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then it goes on. Now we're going to come to this passage, which is so important. 
Now, where it says dwelt in that verse, see, and dwelt among us, that means tabernacled, tabernacled. That is, he set up his tent. He set up his tent. That is, his flesh was the tent into which the word dwelt. You see that? That's it. His flesh was the, was the tent, and the word dwelt there. Well, wait a minute. Isn't the tabernacle a pretty important thing in the Bible? You see, those people who want to just minimize the law, you realize the law contains types and pictures. And, yeah, look at this. I mean, if you see this, if you see all these tremendous pictures in the um, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, the brazen laver, and then the tent proper. These things here are types. They are types. Tupos. It's a type. And they then inform us of the Christ. The Christ. The Messiah, meaning the anointed one. You notice that Paul, speaking to us, says the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Christ to us too. That's a connection, friends, with what went on in the Old Testament, if you didn't know. There is a direct connection between our hope and the person of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. So here we have a picture pointing towards the Christ. And then when you discover this monumental person, then this feeds back. Have you heard of a feedback loop? Or well, sometimes feedback loops will blow your brain because they just get larger and larger, right? And they go through the mic and, and back and around, and around and they just get like this and they whistle and they make all sorts of noises. But there is a feedback loop in which this constructs in a, in a very great way where you, where you learn something about Christ and then you say, oh, wait a minute, yeah? And then you go back to the tabernacle and then you learn about the skins and the badger skins and the pomegranates and you, you start to read about the fact that the high priest would go only once a year into, in beyond the veil that divided the holiest uh, to, with the holy place and he would go in there not without blood. And yeah, man. And the more you read this, and the more you read about the Christ, the reality of Christ, and go back and, and study it, the more information you get. It informs you more and more about the Christ and what his sacrifice means, and what he did. Okay. Now watch. Here we come. Verse 15. John bear witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Yeah, man, he sure was. When it says before him in some real amazing way, before there was time, before there was matter, as we know it, the word existed. Look, look at the verse 1 again. We'll come back to that. But look at the verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word. Let's read that again. In the beginning, the Word already was. <laughs> See that? In the beginning was the Word. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in the beginning, the Word already was. There's no time when the Word was not. He created all things. He is the Creator. God spoke things into existence with what his word you mean you could have god without his word no of course not you can't have god without his word what is he speechless strange god god spoke all things let there be light and there was light let there be animals and all these creatures and so it was the most marvelous thing is god's creation 
Okay, carry on. Because I won't get here if I keep going like this. And it says this. In verse 15, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received. Now watch this. And of his fullness. Kai ek tu pleromatos. There's the fullness of him. And out of his fullness, all we have received. All we have received. And grace. And here it comes. Kai, Karen, anti, karatos. That means and grace over against grace. Anti, anti. That's an interesting expression. Grace for grace. And then it says in verse 17, for, for the law was given through Moses, Moses, through Moses. Cool, man. Now, wait a minute. It says, and grace for grace, and grace over against grace. What's he talking about? The explanation comes. Look at this. For, he's going to explain what this means. Let's say it again. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Okay, what? what? Grace for grace? What? What does that mean? Grace for grace. For the law. Oh, okay. The law was given by Moses. So, the grace over against grace... There was grace in the Old Testament through Moses. Yes, there was grace there. But it was typical. There was grace there, but it pointed towards the antitype, which is Jesus bringing forth grace. For the law was given by Moses, and here it comes, but grace and truth, true grace, came by Jesus Christ. Now we got it. Now we got it. It goes back to this, right? This whole business of types. Sure, you'll find grace pictured and typified in the Old Testament. But true grace, true grace comes here through Jesus Christ. True grace. He is the one who fulfills this. Okay. Here is the expression, Karen anti carrotos. Now it's not carrots, as much as I like carrots. Karen anti carrotos. Grace for grace. You find some interesting expressions like this anti preposition with the genitive, or really with a local sense, over against, opposite, usually used figuratively in the New Testament. And Here's the places where you find it being used. Matthew 5.38 An eye for an eye. An eye for an eye. Yeah, that's one usage of it. An eye for an eye. Someone does something wrong and then it's got to be equated with some sort of action that equals what went before. An eye for an eye. That's the, the law, right? An eye for an eye. Boy, it's strict. Yeah, it's strict, man. Now, if you look at this, this comes to us, um, and as you read down in verse 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. That's what we're interested in. Here it is, grace and truth. This is what we call a hindi addis. A hindi adis. Hin, one, dia, through, dis, two. One through two. Okay, you've got two things here, but they mean the one thing. They mean true grace. True grace. Grace and truth. True grace. Interesting. Now, if you go through the word Moses in the book of John, there are lots of places where it's comes up, but I want to just show you two places here. John 3, 14. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Okay, you've got a picture in the Old Testament of the serpent lifted up. We use this in medical fields today. Serpent lifted up. But who is the reality? The Son of Man must be lived. That's Jesus. Jesus the Messiah. Look down here. Type and the fulfillment, right? The picture and the fulfillment of it. John 6, 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true, the true bread from heaven. The true bread. The true bread. True grace, right? That's the fulfillment of the picture. And that's the point that's coming out here. True grace. So, you'll find grace in the Old Testament pictured in type. Hmm. So, back in the Old Testament, you'll find lots of these types and shadows. They're, they're important to us. This thing's out of battery. So, what are we going to do with this? We say, well, um, yeah, we've got Jesus Christ, and therefore we don't need the types and the pictures. But wait a minute. If understanding about Christ allows us to go back into the types and learn more about the Christ, why would you throw them away? Why would you ever think to throw away the picture book? If it informs us even further of the Christ through this feedback loop, right? Why would you throw them away? You get a map. Now, look, I'm certainly not saying this. You know, you're seeing this, right? You've seen this picture, right? Which I think is absolutely blasphemous. But what it is, is, you know, you'll see all this idea. Well, yeah, you, you, there's, there's lots of ways of getting to the top of the mountain. Lots of roads and many ways to God, you know? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. That's one way, right? Jesus is the only way. Yeah, but wait a minute. I agree with that. There's only one way. But how do you get to that one way? How do you get to that one way? The Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the more you learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you see how that Jesus fulfills all of these different types. Lots and lots of pictures. We get a map. Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle? For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. There's pictures in the Old Testament that you can learn from. For one thing, the law is absolutely relevant to us today in this one way we can see in that it gives us pictures of Christ and through this feedback loop we can learn more about the sacrifice of Christ through the Old Testament pictures. They're there. This one here, the wilderness tabernacle. Why, you can make this a real study. There's the word. See the, the word there, skene. That's a tent. He tabernacled with us. People have produced these great things. Alfred Edersheim, for example. Big, thick book where he goes through all of the parts of the tabernacle showing you the connection with Christ. What, do you think this is nonsense? No, this is not nonsense. This is part of the truth of the types that are in the Old Testament. The tabernacle pointing towards Jesus Christ. Is that relevant to us today? You bet it's relevant to us today. People who say the law has no, nothing to say to us today. That's nonsense. That is absolutely nonsense. It has a lot to say to us. Why? Because through types and pictures, it points to Jesus Christ. And you will discover things about Jesus Christ you did not know before by simply reading about those types. Similarly, the temple. There is light and light, true light, right? There's light in the Old Testament, but there's the true light of Jesus. There's glory in the Old Testament, 
But then there is this great glory that comes with Jesus Christ, what he accomplished. Is there more grace? Yes, there is more grace to be found in the scriptures. In Ephesians it says, verse, chapter 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So, my friends, this is what we have come to realize. The Bible has all sorts of wonderful truths. In terms of hope, you must rightly divide it. But there are doctrinal things that pertain to Jesus Christ that you can fi find from the beginning in Genesis right across to Revelation. You can find truths in there concerning his sacrifice. And that impringes on us too. But my friends, the special calling that we have here is something that is super abounding grace that not all will see. Paul prays concerning the Ephesians that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. We want these eyes of understanding to be open. We believe that, my friends. We believe that strongly here, that yes, there is a special revelation that was given to Paul the prisoner. And Paul the prisoner gives to us special revelation concerning our individual hope. Yes, our salvation comes through the sacrifice of Christ. But our hope is a part of that superabounding grace that God has revealed to Paul the prisoner and then from him to us. It's a rock and roll, friends. And we don't, we don't have time to get into all of this today, but we, uh, we're going to look at this word abolished. All right? There, there's a passage here. Before we leave, just look at this one here in Romans 3.31. Look at this in English. Do we then make void the law through faith? Look at this. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid... Yea, we establish the law. Now put that in your pipe and smoke it for a while. You know what I'm saying? That one there needs a bit of thought, don't you think? That, that baby there, that's going to that's gonna open up a real Pandora's box right there. And we will do it. But not today, we're out of time. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this ministry that we have here and all the truths that uh, Thou hast given us and the tremendous uh, expression of faith found in Jesus Christ who is the perfecter of our faith, the one who went all the way without wavering, Lord. We pray that we would live our lives like Him. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.